The video which you are about to see is an account of the tragedy which befell a film franchise, in particular a recent atrocity committed by a popular streaming service. It is all the more tragic that of the films in said franchise, few have understood what made the first movie so impactful to begin with. But even the series creator Toby Hooper could not have expected, nor would he have wished to see, such a mad and macabre desecration of his brainchild. The sequels of the following five decades were to lead to one of the most bizarre chronologies in the annals of film history, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre series. What are you doing? Try anything and you cancel, bro. Has there been a film franchise outside of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, horror or otherwise, where each sequel has essentially been a course correction from the previous film? It seems like each Texas Chainsaw Massacre sequel or follow-up painted the series into a corner, forcing the next installment to either ignore, remake, or retcon the series. Maybe it's time to just shut down. Time to shut down the show, yeah. Yeah, pull the plug. Now I know I traditionally cover comedy films on this channel, but there's surprisingly a lot of humor in these movies. Some intentional... I'M BRINGING IT DOWN! DOWN TO HELL! BRING IT ALL DOWN! Others, not so much. It's also just laughable how dead wrong some of these movies have been in trying to capture the success of the original film. Chief amongst them, Netflix's recent Texas Chainsaw Massacre, a legacy sequel that ignores all the other sequels and takes the story to present day, which isn't even the first sequel to do that. Oh well, at least this one wasn't in 3D. Put it down! <laughs> But I don't think people realize just how insane the continuity, or lack thereof, is between these movies. Seriously, imagine showing this list to someone unfamiliar with these movies, and asking them to put them in what they think is the right order. It'd be impossible. What kind of sick shit is this? But each entry not only differs widely in title, but also tone, structure, and cast. It's all worth discussing though, so let's take a look back at a film franchise that has been massacred more severely than the victims in any of its films. The original 1974 film was groundbreaking in its own right. The brainchild of director-writer Toby Hooper and co-writer Kim Henkel was the result of the rapidly changing cultural landscape of the 1970s, as well as real-life horror stories like that of Ed Gein. Yeah, when I was like three or four years old, uh, and, and so when the Wisconsin relatives came to town, they always had this story, you know, because they could see that it wound me up, and it started scaring the hell out of me. It was notoriously low budget, resulting in both a literal and thematic grain that came from being shot on 16mm on location during peak Texas humidity. While Leatherface, the human flesh-wearing mute played by Gunnar Hansen, became the literal poster child for the movie, he was actually part of an ensemble of equally sadistic characters, including Drayton Sawyer, the Hitchhiker, and Grandpa. It laid the foundation for virtually every slasher film that followed, and paved the way for generations of horror filmmakers, along with being a huge commercial success. Even so, it would surprisingly take 12 years for a follow-up to materialize, though it's probably the only properly titled sequel in the series. On top of having the polish and budget of a studio film, with Canon Films producing, Toby Hooper also wanted this film to differ tonally, and be more comedic in tone. I mean, this is a, I mean, there's some tricks up my sleeve that, uh, you know, that makes this different, it's certainly different from all the 13ths and the Halloweens and, uh, you know, and all of those. In what way? Well, I can't, I can't, I gotta, I, I'll have to wait and let you see the picture. Everything from the film's poster, so the performances are purely satirical. Some kind of crazy booger just skits through here. Now, booger? How big? Big crazy booger. Leatherface, Drayton, and Grandpa return, 
along with new sibling Chop Top, played by Bill Mosley. It's pretty evident that Hooper wasn't really thinking about long-term franchise potential as much as he was just having fun here, as the movie ends with Leatherface being impaled by a chainsaw. Love it or hate it, it's worth watching just for how different it strive to be. But at the time of this movie's release, 1986, the horror genre was experiencing a boom like it never had before, with Friday the 13th and Nightmare on Elm Street becoming major franchises. Oh, businessman! Always, always, always gets it in the ass! The latter of which was produced by New Line Cinema, who saw the potential in franchising the Texas Chainsaw Massacre in a similar way. Hey, how about uh, Let's make a deal right here. Real cash money. They acquired the rights in the late 80s and set out to make Leatherface their next horror icon, even releasing this teaser trailer before they had a script completed. Leatherface, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3. But where could they possibly go with the story? The last movie ended with the series' main villain being supposedly killed with a chainsaw. Well, fear not. A chainsaw impalement can simply be fixed with a leg brace in this world. What kind of sick shit is this? Taking a page from the Rambo playbook, New Line titled this new sequel, Leatherface, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3, released in 1990. What was it anyway, the, the Rambo 3 soundtrack? <laughs> The title character is now living amongst new family members, one of whom is played by Viggo Mortensen. Excuse me. That man in the corner. Who is he? That round ear. He's known as Strider. Strider. I wish you'd call me Tex. The only other returning family member is Grandpa. Well, his corpse anyway. Apparently the final cut was massacred by the studio to appease the MPAA, resulting in some inconsistencies throughout. Despite the negative reception, I've always had a soft spot for this one though. Tonally, it bridges the gap between the horror of one and the absurdity of two, but still stands on its own. It's also enhanced by an amazing performance by the great Ken Foray. Despite trying to mainstream the series for general audiences, the movie flopped. New Line Cinema then gave up the rights to the series, leading to original co-writer Kim Henkel trying to return the series to basics with Texas Chainsaw Massacre The Next Generation in 1995. To further add to the confusion, the film was known as the return of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre during production and its premiere at South by Southwest Film Festival in 1995. You know the drill by now. New movie, new family for Leatherface. This one is notable for featuring Matthew McConaughey and Renee Zellweger in early film roles. Go ahead, look again! I think I want you to stop and let me out. <laughs> you think? Or do you know? Huh? Go ahead and have a look! though there's not much else here worth talking about, except for Leatherface fully embracing cross-dressing. <laughs> Columbia Pictures bought the film and then retitled it to the Texas Chainsaw Massacre The Next Generation and released it in 1997, tying the marketing around Renee Zellweger's newfound stardom after being in Jerry Maguire. <laughs> I appreciate Henkel for trying to return the series to its roots, but man is this movie bad. A monster chasing her with a chainsaw. What kind of sick shit is this? A remake would come in 2003, produced by Michael Bay and Platinum Dunes. I have to give this one credit for finally making Leatherface part of an equally terrifying family again including the great Arlie Ermey as his uncle. She ain't gonna bite you, she's dead her in the goddamn doornail, get a hold of her and pick her up. Though once again, they painted themselves into a corner, with Leatherface losing an arm at the end of the movie. 
Though the film was a success, I guess they felt they couldn't logically go forward with the story, resulting in a prequel to the remake in 2006. I'm glad you brought your little buddy. Hmm. I like your new face. I personally would have loved a follow-up, though, where Leatherface has a chainsaw arm, kind of like Ash Williams of the Evil Dead series. Despite achieving some financial success, Platinum Dunes discontinued their remake series. The brand was acquired by Lionsgate in 2009, hey, how about you? Uh, let's make a deal right here. who instead of yet another remake, chose to make a direct sequel to the original, picking up just moments after the ending and then flash-forwarding to the present day. Despite some inspiring creative choices, the movie falls apart by the end, though, with the protagonist, played by Alexandra Daddario, teaming up with Leatherface after discovering he's her long-lost cousin. <laughs> This one also has the worst title of the bunch. It's just called Texas Chainsaw. It'd be like calling a Nightmare on Elm Street sequel just Elm Street. And it's also in 3D for terribly dated shots like this. <laughs> Even though the movie ends with what feels like an opportunity to finally take the series forward, Lionsgate chose instead to make yet another prequel, called Leatherface. Not to be confused with the third sequel, also called Leatherface. Though this movie makes the odd choice of not revealing which of the characters is the titular Leatherface until the very end. You heard right, they made a Leatherface movie where we don't even know which one is Leatherface. It was shot in 2015 with a planned theatrical release the following year, but when test screenings bombed, the movie was shelved until 2017 before finally being dumped on DirecTV. Maybe it's time to just shut down. Time to shut down the show, yeah. Yeah, pull the plug. With the series having gone in every possible direction, you would think it'd be impossible to logically make a sequel. Well, then came Halloween 2018 showing the correct way to do a legacy sequel. It also became one of the top-grossing R-rated movies of all time. Dollar, dollar, bills, y'all. Inspiring other studios to acquire horror properties for similar treatment. Uh, let's make a deal right here. Legendary purchased the rights to the series that year, and quickly started planning their sequel. Mimicking the structure of the new Halloween, they envisioned a sequel that ignored all the other sequels, centering around an older Leatherface, wreaking havoc in the present day. You know, exactly the same thing they did in 2013. I'll actually give Texas Chainsaw 3D credit though in the creative way they brought Leatherface into the present, with him being rushed into hiding after the events of the first movie and kept hidden under the watchful eye of his grandmother, until she dies and he is accidentally freed. It explains why there hasn't been another massacre since 1973, while still respecting the character's lure. In this new installment, it's explained that after the events of the first movie, Leatherface entered an orphanage where he's remained for 50 years, just waiting for some meddling kids to show up, even hiding his chainsaw in the wall for just such a purpose. That still works, after 50 years of inactivity. I'm getting ahead of myself, though. The problems with this movie began almost immediately. The original director's hired, siblings Ryan and Andy Tohill, were fired only a week into production. They were replaced with David Blue Garcia, who reshot the movie from scratch. While the reason given at the time was that the duo left the project due to creative differences, it seems that Legendary was instrumenting story changes that the pair didn't agree with. Get the f out of here! The reshot movie reportedly had disastrous test screenings, though, resulting to it being trimmed to just over an hour and sold to Netflix instead of releasing theatrically. Real cash money. Now, it's worth mentioning that aside from the third film being shot in California and 3D being shot in Louisiana, most of the films were shot in Texas, and rightfully so, as Texas is an integral part of these movies. Number one, the Sawyers are number one! <laughs> number one! <laughs> the 2017 prequel was shot in Bulgaria for budgetary reasons, and so was this one. And it shows. Not a single location in this movie looks like it's actually Texas. 90% of the movie takes place on this downtown set that looks like the main street of a theme park. This set is doubling for what's supposed to be Harlow, Texas, an essentially abandoned town that's been bought by a group of... 
influencers, who plan to auction off buildings to gentrify the area. And sold to Candace Brady of Brady's Brunch. Oh, I love brunch. That's great. It's like the writers failed to understand any hint of what made the original movie terrifying. The young protagonists there are just out for a summer drive when they end up stranded. It makes what happens all the more horrific, with them just being at the wrong place at the wrong time. It gives the Sawyers a sadistic edge in how brutal they are for no real reason. Here, not only do these bland, boring characters make themselves instantly unwelcomed in this town, they also kinda draw first blood by giving Leatherface's adoptive mother a heart attack. I paid everything I owed. This is still our house. You're wrong. I'm sorry, but- I've got a title that says otherwise. This happens when they wrongfully evict her from a home that she still owns, but I don't know why the police don't realize this. Get the f out of here! The only one of the teen characters that has any kind of arc is Lila. That arc being she survived a school shooting and needs to overcome that or something? I don't know. Speaking to Collider, producer Fede Alvarez commented on this story element, saying, I think you do a movie that's called Texas Chainsaw Massacre in this day and age, it wasn't going to be called a massacre by just killing five people. And the shooting in a way at the beginning kind of shows that. The fact that we live in times when massacres do happen. What the f okay, not to come back to Halloween 2018 again, but do you remember the subtle way that they handled the same theme? There's a lot worse stuff that's happening today, and like, I mean, what, a couple people getting killed by one guy with a knife is not that big of a deal. Here, they force in that same theme with a lot less subtlety. Also, a group of young people being horrifically murdered by a cannibalistic family with one killer still at large would still be referred to as a massacre in the present day. It's different than Michael Myers stabbing four people and being caught. Speaking of forced things here, the original film's protagonist, Sally Hardesty, returns. Now a hardened senior citizen, hellbent on revenge. She has spent the last 50 years waiting for Leatherface to resurface. Sound familiar? Yeah, it yep. went really, it went Hey, well. Mom. That's mine. Now, unlike Laurie Strode, Sally Hardesty feels so out of place in a legacy sequel. Not only did the original Sally actress Marilyn Burns pass away in 2014, but the character just has no logical reason to be in this story. It's him, isn't it? <laughs> Leatherface. Also, why hasn't she been able to find Leatherface for 50 years? He was wearing a mask. Not easy to locate someone if you don't know what they look like. Okay, but even without the mask, wouldn't it be easy to line up the hulking, lumbering, old mute men with bad teeth nearby? Especially considering it's a desolate area. When Sally finally does find him, does she kill him? No. She goes full Inigo Montoya on him. Pamela. Jerry. And Franklin. Prepare to die. She ends up missing multiple opportunities to end him, which results in her own death, giving her character no purpose. Get the f out of here! The movie actually comes really close to giving her arc a payoff when Sally realizes that Leatherface doesn't even remember her. You don't remember me? Because he wouldn't. The first movie showed us just what a mindless killer he was. He wasn't motivated by revenge, but by pure evil. It's why the horror in that original movie is so brutal. And not only that, Leatherface wasn't the only monster. He was a product of a family of monsters. At least the other sequels and even remake understood this by making him part of a family. Did you, didn't you? Go check it out, boy! Ironically, the best analogy I can express for this movie comes in the scene when Leatherface finally masks up. Now, in all of the other movies, Leatherface always seems to take pride in his masks, crafting them by hand and drying them out, sewing them up with thread, and even applying cosmetics. In this movie, his mask is the fresh-cut face of his deceased mother, even though Leatherface traditionally only used his victims for his masks. Then he just plops it on top of his actual face. No string, no thread, no thought. And it stays in place the whole movie. It's a sloppy, nonsensical execution of something iconic, and a perfect analogy for this entry in the franchise. We definitely haven't seen the last of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre series, but I just hope that wherever it goes in the future, the creative team finally understands the simplicity that made that original such a classic.